All right, hi, I'm Rudy, and I'm Ed. We're gonna be presenting in stereo, which might make you dizzy because we might walk across the stage in bad Um This is what we're calling our talk, Make the Logo Smaller. Uh, it's basically like a behind the scenes look at what happens when your kind of cushy job as a designer changes completely, morphs into a completely different career that you would never really in a million years have ever expected for yourself but still love in ways that you can't explain. Strangely. This is, um, some of these talks tend to be really long humble brags, basically, and uh, I think that's essentially what this is going to be, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, but what we tried to do is tweak the talk a little bit to pull out some insights that we've earned uh, and learned over the years uh, that any, I think any creative person uh, would be uh, well served by. So. And hopefully, actually, there's some ideas here that, as Ed said, could be useful. Feel free to rip off any without credit. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we are a brand intelligence agency that's helping our clients become deep brands. So we've been working on that wording for about six years, and obviously it still sucks because you still have no idea what we do, right? Um, but largely, what it is, is we're helping brands um, act better rather than just trying to look and sound better. We've got a long track record. We started in 2004. Uh, we've worked with a range of clients across a range of industries, small and large startups, Fortune 500, Fortune 100, companies looking to kind of pivot, change, adapt to uh, prevailing market forces. Um, and things were relatively sort of stable for um, the first more than half of that period of time, uh, where we kind of knew what business we were in, we knew who we were going to work with, we knew what would come out of the end of a project. But then about six years ago, things completely changed radically for us. Uh, changed who we do what we do for, and again, how we go about it. And like all good things, it started. It started when we got fired. <laughs> so we were working for a company, um, doing the work we usually do. Uh, they called us up one day and they said, uh, you guys are gone. <laughs> and it wasn't like one of those peaceful partings, like, let's agree to disagree and we'll move on. This is why we're It was like, oh boy. <laughs> so uh, that caused us uh, a little bit of strife internally. We were like, what happened here? Why did this happen? Um, and what are we going to do? And it kind of happened because of a pesky little thing called the truth. A little bit of backstory about the client. They were sort of a a uh, global energy company focused on solar and renewable. Uh, they had a huge kind of runway ahead of them. And the ask from the manager team, and actually we only talked to the manager team, which is maybe part of the problem, uh, was to give us uh, an identity and a brand that could be part of a movement, basically transforming the way energy is created, distributed, shared, um, with the end goal, of course, of improving life on the planet, which is hugely aspirational, and we came back to them was something that fit that to a T, and they freaked out. <laughs> like, no, 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 we can't go there, we can't go there, we can't go there. And in the end, we kind of agreed to to, to this idea of like, okay, let's, let's sleep on it, and like I said, by the time we got back to our studio, <laughs> right? And it made us, like I said, do a lot of soul searching, trying to figure out like, what did we lack? What, what put us into this situation where it was basically our point of view versus their point of view and us reflecting their point of view and no sort of ammunition for making the argument around why you should do this, why you should, I don't know, stick to your guns, basically. So in creative work, it often comes down to this subjective argument around like, I think this looks good or, you know, or they think something else looks good, or we're arguing over our own personal feelings of aesthetics. Um, and it's the same in branding around just the words that we're using and the ideas that we're trying to bring up. So what we realized is we did need some ammunition, um, and we asked ourselves, like, what can we possibly bring to the table that, that will be irrefutable? Like, what, what can we bring? And we realized that we need to bring the truth. And so the next few slides, we're talking about a few buckets of truth that we've discovered over the years um, that help us do our job better for our clients and help kind of enlighten them um, in, in a way that it's not about us winning the argument, but it's about us finding something that is true and solid that they can actually rest a foundation on. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is um, the customer truth. And there's an old 
saying, I think it's like Henry Ford, like if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would say a faster horse. Um, so then there's a pervasive idea in industry that customers don't know what they want. You know, we're the geniuses building these products. Steve Jobs, I think, also pushed that idea. And we think that's patently false. I think people really do know what they want. As Chris was saying earlier, they want to feel comfortable. They want to feel beautiful. They want to feel uh, like they're going faster. They want to have more free time. Um, and the problem that the industry has is we tend to ask the wrong questions. So customers are full of amazing insights and ideas if you can get in front of them and ask the right questions. And similarly, we realize in the opposite of our engagement when we got fired, we needed to talk to more people within the organization, not just management, right? Because the people within the company, the rank and file across all sorts of different divisions of the company, are the ones that know where the secret magic is within a company, and they also kind of know where the bodies are buried. Right? They know, they know that uh, it's going to take X and Y to get Z done. Um, and oftentimes, management is kind of like Steve Jobs, living in a world of uh, reality distortion, right? And if you can get into a company, spend as much time as you can with people within, uh, the people on the uh, on the front lines who are responsible for doing, and find out what their truth is, and then reflect it back to management you get at a much, much more profound sense of what is this company actually trying to do. Sorry to talk smack about Steve Jobs and Apple things. But <laughs> yeah. and people He's got to find <laughs> <laughs> um, The last truth was around business strategy. Uh, and this is kind of a doozy because as we uh, have experienced over the last few years, most companies actually don't have a strategy. Or if they do, nobody knows what it is. Um, the most important thing at a company is to have a, a goal and a path to achieve that goal. It's pretty simple. Uh, but if you think, if you work for a large company or uh, even a small company, like, do you know what those things are? Many times uh, employees don't. And so that has a massive negative effect on alignment and about the company actually achieving something. So what happens is without that strategic uh, center, the business tends to be pulling itself apart in different directions. You know, the, Accounting is doing one thing, sales is doing one thing, marketing is doing one thing, and they all hate each other. Um, so a lot of the work that we do is uh, teasing out like what the strategy is. Is it there or isn't it? Are the leaders aligned on that strategy? If it's not there, can we sort of manufacture it uh, with their approval? <laughs> uh, can we trick them into having a strategy, essentially? Um, but th there always is one there. It's just a matter of like, kind of pulling it out. So as two former designers who uh, realized that they needed to go deeper with their clients, um, our whole sort of sense of our purpose as creatives changed, right? Um, we went through this process that was really, really humbling, in some ways, <laughs> right? Of going from being kind of in the guru stance, you know, people who were sought out for our expertise and our abilities and our sensibilities and our aesthetic, uh, to being people who were really more in the Sherpa stance, you know, people who were. Uh, helping your clients sh schlep up the mountain with the heavy load, right? People who are more valuable for their questions than their answers. So in defining this idea of a deep brand, uh, over time we've kind of landed on these three sort of principles or ideas that define what a deep brand is. So the first one is, um, does the brand know itself? Are they able to look critically at themselves? Second one is, do they have a common and shared principles and priorities? In other, in other words, that's that strategy stuff. Do we know why we're here? And do, do we know what to do next? <laughs> and then the third thing is uh, this idea of knowing their customers. Um, and I think Chris earlier tapped into some of that. Uh, our opinion is that you have to know your customers from the heart. Like if you go into a butcher shop somewhere, a butcher knows his customers, right? So much more than a tech company knows theirs. So if you nail all that, and we'll kind of unpack that a little bit more in a second, but if you nail all that, you build a deep brand. And deep brands are different than other brands because they're sure-footed but nimble at the same time. They have deep, deep roots, so they can weather all sorts of change in the market. Like they're not easily toppled, not easily disrupted. They can change and adapt while still staying true to themselves and address competition in a very effective way. We're gonna unpack those um those three principles of what a deep brand is. And the first one is that idea of like uh, looking in the mirror, being able to be critical of yourself as a brand. So just to kind of examine what that <laughs> really looks like, it, 
the first phase of our project is, is usually some kind of discovery phase where we talk to um, the leaders and we're like, okay, so why are we here? Why did you hire us? And then we go talk to the employees and we ask them, so what's going on with this company? Like, what are the problems? Where are the bodies buried? Um, and then the third thing is we go talk to the customers and we ask them, like, what's your life like? Like, what are you trying to achieve? What, what are your goals? Right? And, and then sort of secondarily, like, how does this company fit into that? When we come back from that, uh, from doing that work, we have some synthesis deck that is basically all this information. And I have to tell you, it's like it's usually not great news. I mean, if, the reason, if they hired us in the first place, it means there's a problem. And so we go out and we find the problem and we show it to the to the leaders. And sometimes it's internal, sometimes it's external, sometimes it's both. Like where these problems lay. We know right away if this is going to be a good engagement if. Uh, the leaders then take that information and go, yes, like, how can we attack? How can we fix this? Like, what's going on over here? Like, how can we dive deeper into that? That's a great customer right there for us. Um, a bad client is one that says, oh, no, 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 no. You didn't talk to the right people, or that's just a one-off case, or, you know, oh, no, that, who, who would you talk to inside? Like, what department were they in? <laughs> that's when we know, oh, this is going to be a doozy. So next, um, deep brands, like, really literally get their customers. They have a different point of view around what makes a customer a customer. It's not just a buyer. It's not someone who you have to attract and then transact with and then let go of forever. They view their customers more as users. And I think this is something that's prevalent, incre increasingly prevalent in the market right now because people have a longer term engagement with the brands that they signal their allegiance to. And those brands need to show up for them in a more meaningful way, not just once, but over the life of their relationship with that individual. So the last thing is, uh, we think deep brands work as one. They are aligned and united in how they operate. And part, part of that is just that everyone in the company knows the strategy. They know what their goal is and they know how to get there. The opposite of that is um, a company that's based on wishful thinking. So you could do the typical brand work where you say, okay, what are we trying to achieve? What's our aspirational goal? And then you go tell the world, like, you're going to be so beautiful if you put on our sneakers. The fact is, you're not going to be beautiful if you put on those sneakers, right? They're not following through on actually uh, the, making good on the promise that they're making. So uh, if you have a, a strategy that's solid and you can get everyone in the company working in alignment on that strategy and those next steps, you're so much more empowered to make good on the promise that you made. Yep. So a little bit of detail on how we go about it, which is still an evolving process. Uh, no project is ever really the same, but we've noticed over time, at least over the last six years, that there's sort of these three kind of uh, buckets, in essence, of, of how we engage with our clients. The first one is research, or you know, digging in really, really deep. Um, it's kind of twofold, usually. It's like going in and talking to people within the organization, and like I said, like sometimes bringing back uh, harsh truth <laughs> to, to power. And then secondarily, going out and talking to real people in the real world. Um, not always about their thoughts, uh, more about their feelings, you know, their gut reactions, you know, um, what they want as people, as individuals. Um, secondly, we take all of that and we bring it back to the company, and usually with cross-functional teams that are very, um, sometimes at odds, you know, like people from all different divisions are trying to solve different parts of the problem, oftentimes across purposes, and then we hash it out. We try and get people with strong opinions to argue, basically. Um, and then lastly, we take everything that we heard and we try and condense it. Right, which is the hardest part. <laughs> to try to get things down to a simple enough level of resolution that's consumable by everyone within the company. Um, which is really the, where the magic lies. We haven't completely nailed that yet. And usually our decks are 100 slides long. <laughs> it's just that. So we're going to uh, go through a few uh, examples of some of the clients we've worked with. And our goal here was you know, to tell you a little bit about the work, but that's kind of boring. I think the more interesting thing is like, what did we learn along the way uh, that might be interesting for you? Like, uh, hopefully something you can take away and use in the work that you're doing. Because um, these are painful lessons a lot of times for us to learn, or experiments that we did. And, and we tend to fail uh, a lot on small experiments so that we can succeed uh, in the larger effort. Um, so the first uh, client was OpenTable. And um, not everyone knows this, but OpenTable makes money when um, the restaurant pays them when you make a reservation. So you make a reservation for four, open table gets like four dollars. You make a reservation for two, open table gets two dollars, and that's paid for by the restaurant. Um, they're the biggest 
in the space, biggest uh, company in the space, uh, and they've been doing it for 20 years. And their problem was they had this antiquated platform that was 20 years old, which is geriatric in tech years, right? Uh, and they had a bunch of small companies coming in, sort of nipping away and pulling aside, pulling, pulling away their best uh, customers. So they came to us and asked, like, what's going on? Like, why, why are we, which is the best company with the best product with the most features, being uh, losing deals to these little upstart companies that have like no uh, diners in their network? So we went out. We talked to restaurants across the country: New York, Denver, Los Angeles, San Francisco, um, which was amazing. Like you go to a restaurant, uh, and every place we went, uh, we sat down with this uh, person that owned the restaurant, and the first thing they said to us was, "Sparkling or still." I was like, huh, that's interesting. Usually when we go interview people, they're like, when am I going to get paid and how long is this going to last? <laughs> so it was like, wow, that was like really nice. Uh, and it was, the, it was the first hint of this insight that we came away from, probably the biggest insight of this project, was that these companies, uh, these restaurants, uh, they act more like families than businesses. And the, their highest value, the thing that they care about most, is hospitality. So their problem was they weren't seeing um, Open Table acting in the same way. They felt that the relationship with Open Table was more transactional and less familial. So we came back to Open Table a second with a bunch of stuff, but this was sort of the big one, which is like, hey, you need to act with hospitality. You need to be part of the family. You need to be one of the people in this industry, not a service provider. And that has ramifications for uh, how they create products, what features they put in, how they communicate with their customers, how sales is done, how marketing is done, if you think about it. Um, Overkill is a pretty big company, they have 600 employees uh, in their offices downtown. So how do you get this news out to all these people? And in this case, our client actually, and this is the little freebie that we're going to give to you, <laughs> our client actually came up with this idea of office hours. So what we would do is we'd go in twice a week, we'd get a conference room, we'd sit there, and open door policy, and anyone from the company could come in and say, hey, Sequitur, I'm doing email marketing. So what do I do with the results of the, you know, what you guys came up with? And so we have a conversation. We don't know anything about email marketing, really, but they do. And but we know about the customer, and we know about this work. So we sort of merge our minds together, and in an hour, we would transform the way they did email marketing. Or someone from billing, you know, how do we transform billing? What does this mean for billing? Does it mean anything? Well, let's think about it. Like, what does billing do? So we have these conversations and transform the way they work. The 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 act of being in the customer's place in our clients place of business was powerful. They saw us all the day, all the time. They would come by, we started chit-chatting, we would learn about other little aspects of their business. Um, they took our ideas more seriously, we took their ideas more seriously, and it showed that we were committed to them and we were truly a part of the team when we were in their space. So I highly recommend, if you have the opportunity, if this, ever, this, this kind of thing ever comes up, even if you're in a big company, if you're a design resource at a Google or something, like move into the place where someone is using your services, like go over to that department and sit down and work with those people. Uh, or, you know, if it's your client, like go to their office and hang out, like help them work through those problems in person. Yeah. So next one, I'll go through these, the, I think we're getting close on time. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, So Cliff Bar, they basically came to us because they were having an identity crisis. They were um, a company with like a clear origin story that was really focused on like performance nutrition and people hanging from a cliff and cycling, you know, uh, the Alps. Uh, and they were starting to move into like a broader category, basically a CPG snacking in essence. And they're like, we don't know how to tell our story if we're in all of these different markets, basically, like selling things that are not just like goo that you take if you're, you know, in the middle of the uh, you know, marine century. <laughs> and and so the original ask with this client was like, help us tell our story in digital. We need to show, figure out how we need to exist in digital. And a little tidbit that's a freebie as well. It's a dangerous freebie. Like our studio manager would not like me saying this basically, but the, the freebie is like radically over deliver because our brief was very narrow and we realized that, okay, we're gonna fail at the project we've been asked to succeed at if we don't solve this larger problem. But we didn't have really the latitude to say, hold on, hold on, hold on, let's rescope entirely, right? So, and we kind of bit the bullet and decided, okay, we're not gonna make a ton of money on it's going to be a big ask, you know, a lot of work, uh, but we could learn a lot, right? And so, again, freebie if you want it, consider a project that is going to ask a lot of you, 
and decide whether or not you want to take it at your own risk if the reward might be high enough. Next one is Intuit. Uh, long story short, inside, when you walk inside their headquarters, they have this big, uh, their values written on the wall, and one of those things is like, we love small business. But there was a small team inside Intuit that was starting to realize, like, is that really true? Do we really love small business? Does, does small business feel loved by us? So we were sent out to talk to a bunch of small businesses to see, like, how do you feel about Intuit? If you've ever used QuickBooks, you probably don't feel loved by Intuit. <laughs> <laughs> so we took that information uh, back to them, uh, and we did our decks and all that stuff, but we were inside the company realizing this wasn't really landing. They weren't really hearing us. They had built these personas around their customers that were two-dimensional. You know, they weren't really true to life. And they didn't have any emotional power. So what we did, and this is our little freebie, we made a documentary. And we went out and we went back to the businesses and we said, hey, can we talk to you about your business for a while? Film, uh, strung a bunch of those together, and then this, and then released it internally to it, uh, into it, and it, it kind of went viral. I think the company was hungry to get face to face with their real customers and the real challenges that they have. Yeah. Um, last two. Um, Dolby, uh, they hired us. They were sort of in a similar position as OpenTable. They were an incumbent you know, with a multi-decade uh, history of innovation that had begun to wither from within. Right? They were sort of the industry standard for sound, and their technology is baked into every DVD player, every CD player, every car stereo, every home theater system that was manufactured in the world, basically. So they were minting money. But they saw on the horizon that entire business model about to go poof. Right? They realized, we're in deep shit we don't figure out how to actually make stuff again, right? And so in a culture that had previously been basically like the first sort of innovation lab in the world, you'd say, in technology, um, they were now sort of full of cubes, full of accountants and uh, attorneys. Right? And there's still little pockets of innovation happening, um, but they weren't kind of catching fire. And that was the ask from us, help us figure out how to tap back into that so that we can kind of evolve our business in a way that's more in tune with the way the market is moving, right? Help us return to our former glory, you know, and to secure, uh, secure our future. Um, and the little tidbit about this is that from this day, so the third or fourth management workshop we did was in their then new headquarters on Market Street uh, next to Twitter. They had acquired this building, they're about to move in. Um, they had begun to gut the interior of the building, it was a nasty building inside. <laughs> and we did this workshop um, that was kind of your standard workshop until a certain a couple points, right? One where we brought all the management team into this one space where there was one uh, non-load bearing wall that we were assured had no light current. Right? <laughs> and on the top of the wall, we had printed things to smash from the past. And these little teams from the management team were given these huge kind of tagging sharpies and like, we gave them the brief, like, okay, write down one thing that you want to remove, extract from the culture of this company. It was something you want us to never repeat again. And they're like, okay, I'll get that. So they all did, and it was like wild, but this wall was covered with like bad behavior, basically. <laughs> and they thought, well, okay, that's great. We all go, okay, what are we gonna do with this? And then we brought in a golden sledgehammer, and we gave the CEO, everyone was wearing these like hard hats, we gave the CEO some goggles, and said, okay, take this, hard hat, uh, take this uh, sledgehammer, and choose one thing from this wall to smash, right? And we weren't sure how it was gonna go, but in the end, it was crazy. It was like a rage-fueled <laughs> demolition team. And they basically, like, they would declare what they were gonna smash, and then smash it like crazy, like drywalls flying all over the place. And the lesson learned was like, sometimes it's really good to take the clients out of context, right? And to give them an exercise that's physical, real, and kind of, uh, last one, Clover. We just put this one in because this is Hank, and he's so awesome, one of the people we talk to. Uh, we recruit on Facebook uh, a lot of times. That's how we get the people that we're going to talk to, and it gives us all the, you know, because they're spying on us and all things that we do, <laughs> it allows us to target exactly who we want to uh, talk to and uh, incentivize them with like, a little bit of money to talk to them. Uh, so problem was we went out to New Jersey to talk to some people over 65 uh, about their health care, and nobody wants to talk about health care, uh, their privacy and all that stuff, and people over 65 aren't using Facebook and clicking on ads uh, the way we need them to. So we came up short. Uh, we found ourselves in Jersey City uh, shooting bricks because we didn't have enough people to talk to, and we couldn't go back to our client saying, oh, we couldn't find anybody, sorry, like I guess this project's over. Um, so we're 
racking our brains, like, what can we do? What we decided to do was go to Kinko's, print out a little sandwich board, go to Walmart, where old people go, <laughs> stand by the sandwich board and say, we'll give you money if you'll talk to us about healthcare. We have never experienced so much rejection in our lives. <laughs> you know those people that are outside the grocery store that you don't look at and you try and avoid? Like, that was us. <laughs> And I have a new respect, and I always smile at them now. <laughs> but uh, we got our people. We got some really great people. It took us about four hours, and I think we got four people or something. Yeah, they were awesome. Um, but sometimes the, our little tidbit here is like sometimes you just got to be scrappy. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, I think every every creative person knows this. Uh, sometimes you have to just sort of think outside the box to get that thing done in a way that's going to be like good enough uh, and go outside your comfort zone. Yeah. So in sum, three things. One. Dig deeper, right? Don't believe your client whole hog, because they might not know what they want, and they might not know what they need, right? Sometimes it's up to you to push that a little bit further, even if it's kind of detrimental to your uh, uh, goals. <laughs> Second one is don't ask for permission, especially from non-creative people. Just think about it. If you, if you have an idea and you feel passionate about it, and you go to someone and you say, hey, can I do this? They're going to go, hmm, sounds risky. I'm going to say no. Done. Idea's dead. Terrible idea, right? So uh, always just, if you feel like you have something that's going to work and is going to be great, just do it. Uh, and if you fail, fail quietly by yourself. <laughs> but if it turns out great, you know, like, you get all the credit and it's, it's always going to be better than not trying it. And then the last one is teach them to fish. Right? So basically, um, in order to make an impact, you can't just deliver a finished product or go away, work your magic, come back, give it to them, and go, ta-da. <laughs> you have to oftentimes uh, teach your client to see the world in a new way, which means being very open about your technique. Oftentimes, like at the very beginning, we're like, we have some secret sauce here, it's really amazing, it's really working. But we didn't protect it. We ended up actually training our clients on what we do so that in the future, if they need to do it again, they can do it themselves and do it well. So it's about kind of giving of your own expertise without sort of like holding on to it. And then they call us back for the bigger thing, yeah. right? Because they know how to do the basic stuff. And when they have a real hard problem, that's when they bring us, and then it's more valuable. Yeah. So it, it has paid dividends for us, basically, to be generous with our knowledge. So that's that. <laughs> Thank you guys so much.